Global Inflation. Five ways the U.S. rate hike could affect you. The U.S. Central Bank has announced the largest rate hike in nearly 30 years as it accelerates its fight to contain rising consumer prices. It raised the rate the Federal Reserve required for banks to borrow money by three quarters. The results will be felt in nearly every corner of the economy, in the U.S. and abroad. Here are five ways the U.S. rate hike might affect you. More expensive mortgages and other loans. The immediate effect of this will be in the U.S., where people will face higher borrowing costs for mortgages, credit cards, student loans and other debt. The average rate for a popular 30-year fixed home loan has already risen to around 6% its highest level since 2008. For the person who buys an average-priced home in the U.S., that means monthly payments have increased by nearly $600 since then. Beginning of the year, I wish I had started looking sooner, says Dolores Robinson, a retired Ohio educator who bought a new flat this month. Ms. Robinson says she is relieved to have locked in a relatively low rate, even though it was higher than when she started calling. But for some buyers, rising rates will make purchases out of reach. The National Association of Realtors expects home sales in the U.S. to fall 9% this year. This drop may sound painful for people who are blocked from purchasing, but it is also expected to reduce price increase to 5% in 2022 after double-digit gains in recent years. If that happens, it will help curb inflation, which is a sign that the Fed's moves are working. Smaller pensions and more expensive Uber rides. When rates rise, it causes a dramatic realignment of investments. And these moves were particularly pronounced as general economic concerns escalated. For those with money in the stock market, such as people with 401,000 retirement accounts, this meant seeing a sharp drop in the value of their investments. The S&P 500 has lost more than 20% since the beginning of January, a landmark known as the bear market, while the Nasdaq has lost nearly a third of its value. Risky assets such as cryptocurrencies have also seen their prices fall, and exchanges outside the US have also taken a hit. Investment firms are also pulling back from riskier ventures and demanding profitability from companies that have been losing money for years, like Uber. That means people are faced with higher prices for things like taxis and deliveries, or they see such firms fold, as in the case of a number of startups promising 15 minutes of grocery shopping in New York. In times of uncertainty, investors look for safety. Uber boss Dara Khosraushahi said in a letter to employees last month about the steps the company will take to improve profitability, including slowing hiring. It is clear that the market is experiencing a seismic shift and we need to react accordingly risk of slowdown and recession in the job market. As demand cools, it puts an end to the booming post-pandemic labor market where companies compete fiercely for workers, allowing new hires to manage higher wages and other benefits, and encouraging many to change jobs for the better. Real estate giants Redfin and Compass this week announced plans to cut staff by hundreds this week, citing the decline in higher rates. A number of major companies such as Amazon, Walmart, Tesla and Uber, including Spotify, have also announced plans to slow or halt hiring. Jerome Powell, chairman of the U.S. Central Bank, said he was hopeful the economy would prevent mass job losses, adding that the U.S. labor market continued to be very tight and deficits for job seekers had nearly doubled. But the economy was already facing challenges as inflation increased companies' costs and reduced people's spending power. Growth has already contracted in the first three months of the year. While this is attributed to the oddity in the international trade data, other indicators such as retail sales are starting to dim. Analysts say the bank risks a sustained slowdown, also known as a recession, as higher rates collide with a weakening economy. Stronger dollar. The US dollar is up 10% this year as the Fed's moves prompted investors to shift to the United States in search of higher yields and boosted demand for the currency. For Americans planning trips to places like the UK, where the value of a pound has dropped below $1.20 this week, the lowest level since the pandemic, it's a silver lining. Elsewhere, however, the rise of the US currency has meant imports of more expensive commodities like energy and food, which are often traded in dollars. This adds to economic woes, especially if a government has a lot of dollar-denominated debt. Emerging markets tend to be the ones that really suffer the most, says Fiona Chincota, market analyst at City Index. Higher rates abroad. These dynamics mean that the USA does not walk in a vacuum. Dozens of other countries, including the Bank of England, Switzerland, have also announced rate hikes in recent months. Australia and Canada. Many are fighting their own battle with inflation. 
but they also take cues from what's going on in the world's largest economy. In countries such as Kuwait and Saudi Arabia, where their currencies are tied to the dollar, banks trying to control the outflow of funds to the USA move step by step, while the effect of the US interest rate hikes is seen almost immediately. As these movements begin to be felt on the ground, the economic story in the US will continue to be watched closely. Why is the global inflation problem bigger than US politics? Inflation may be the focus of a medium-term political blame game, but economists caution that the problem, and the most effective solutions, are global. Rising prices were the focus of this week's meeting of the Group of Seven, G7, major economies. The White House said on Tuesday it has invested $760 million to combat the effects of high food, fuel and fertilizer prices, and the European Council said the war in Ukraine has led to steep price increases and that the G7 must help the global economy. Told. Economy. We are determined to strongly support Ukraine in the production and export of grain, oil and other agricultural products and will promote coordinated initiatives that promote global food security and address the causes of the evolving global food crisis, the Council said. Inflation in the U.S. stands at 8.6 percent, a 40-year high, and is making people even poorer by focusing on personal spending. It is fueling protest movements around the world, driven by the rising cost of living felt in the prices of goods like food and gasoline. In the UK, where inflation is higher, over 9 percent, than in the US, the largest rail strike in the past 30 years disrupted travel across the country and saw tens of thousands of workers leave their jobs demanding higher wages. There are also concerns that the rail strike could be the first of many strikes in the country. Members of the UK Railways Union are leading all workers in this country who are sick and fed up with their wages and conditions being cut by a mix of big business profits and government policy, Union Chairman Mick Lynch said last week. He added that his group was looking for an appropriate pay rise. In South Korea, where inflation exceeded 5% for the first time in more than a decade, truckers reached a deal with the government earlier this month after a week's strike to guarantee minimum wages. This led to production cuts at South Korean steelmaker POSCO and automaker Hyundai, and sales were facing adverse external environments, he said. Inflation hit a decade-high 5.2% in France, where there were concerns about a resurgence of yellow vests or yellow vests this fall. Over the past few months, economic and inflation-related protests have been reported in India, Ecuador, Indonesia, Ireland, Tunisia, Sri Lanka and Peru, where the government imposed curfews and took various emergency measures after demonstrations turned violent earlier this year. Dot. Inflation is not just in the US or Europe, but also in developing countries, pretty much everywhere, Hamid Rashid, head of the Global Economic Monitoring Branch of the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs, said in an interview. This prevalence means workers in multiple countries with changing political systems and social dynamics are pushing in the same direction, putting pressure on global labor markets that many central banks are hoping to loosen. Some economists argue that having a looser labor market or slightly higher unemployment in the U.S. will remove some of the pressure for companies to keep raising their prices in order to make a profit for their investors. But with more than 11 million vacancies in the U.S. and the unemployment rate at 3.6%, still not as low as pre-pandemic 3.5 percent, a looser labor market may not be the case at all. This means that, supply-side interventions, which some economists propose to fight inflation, are measures to address certain sectors and pipeline bottlenecks, may not be as effective as policymakers in the U.S. or around the world. When we think about the supply side, we tend to focus on supply chains. Supply chains are part of the supply side, but the most important element of the supply side is the supply of labor, he said. There is a lot of uncertainty in the labor supply, and it combines many supply chain issues, from packaging to shipping, warehouses to port cleaning. Do not underestimate the role the labor supply plays in most economies. With the tight job market in the U.S. and workers able to demand higher wages, both here and elsewhere, it may take some time for the global supply side of the economy to adjust. For this reason, economists see increased international cooperation as an important additional measure in the fight against inflation. This cooperation can take many forms, including coordinated central bank policies, compliance with regulatory frameworks, and supply chain improvements. An unexpected source of cooperation, at least among Western powers, was the war in Ukraine, which economists say has brought the G7 much closer together. Why are we doing this collaboration now? First, admit that this is truly Western collaboration. Abraham Newman, 
a professor in the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, said during an online event on economic globalization hosted by the Brookings Institution that the G7 really led the way. You see within the G7 a complete belief that this is a legitimate exercise. Despite the global nature of inflation, the battle of words between Democrats and Republicans over who will be responsible for the high cost of living is raging. The White House and congressional Democrats deny how their policies are fueling inflation, House Republicans said on Monday, citing the Biden administration's $1.9 trillion stimulus package. A March study from the San Francisco Federal Reserve found that direct fiscal stimulus related to the emerging pandemic under both the Trump and Biden administrations, may have contributed to the rise in U.S. inflation by about three percentage points. 2021. Meanwhile, Democrats are focusing on corporate price gouging and market concentration in the private sector as drivers of inflation. President Biden swore earlier this month to profit oil companies as gas prices soared. And Senator Bernie Sanders, IVT, introduced a bill in March that would tax corporate profits unexpectedly, a measure similar to those enacted in wartime in the 20th century. The American people are sick and tired of the unprecedented corporate greed that exists all over this country. Working families are fed up with being scammed by companies that make record profits while having to pay exorbitant prices for gas, rent, food and prescription drugs. Regardless of whether inflation is a global issue or not, Americans expect action on the inflation front and are likely to voice this expectation at the polls in November. A NewsNation DDHQ poll released last week found that 97% of U.S. voters are very or somewhat concerned about inflation, with inflation being the top concern for 72%. Why are economies collapsing? A new book shows how difficult it is to predict and prevent systemic financial crises. In 1751, Leendert Peter de Neuville, a young Dutchman living in Amsterdam, founded a bank. It was a good move. A few years later, the Seven Years' War began prompting several European powers to seek new funding for their armies. De Neuville became a major lender to Prussia, with loans secured against large stocks of commodities such as wheat and oats. It made incredible profits until the war ended in 1763, food production rose again and prices fell. De Neuville's creditors were cold and had no cash to pay them back, so he had to sell his shares, driving commodity prices down further. The bank soon closed, and its influence quickly spread to other banking centers, including Hamburg and Berlin. Icelandic economist John Daniel's son believes de Neuville's misadventures in banking triggered the first modern global financial crisis. He argues that 1763 was different from what had come before, as it was caused not by war or crop failure, but rather by shadow banking and the widespread use of financial instruments that allowed the concealment and propagation of risk. Over the next 250 years, we experienced many crises like this. What is keeping us from blocking them? It's about our love-hate relationship with finance, according to Daniel's son's new book, The Illusion of Control. For the economy to grow we need banks to accept the risk of lending, but we also need them to take the right amount of risk. Very few and no one can borrow it. Too much and the system blows up. Pleasure. Figuring out what this is the right amount. It has proven extremely difficult to do so even if the increasingly necessary role of banks has made the largest of them too big to fail. Daniel Sun reports that Eric Holder, a former attorney general, admitted to punishing HSBC for failing to prevent Mexican drug traffickers from using its services, worried it would trigger a more damaging crisis. After the 2008-2009 global financial crisis, bankers' attempts to put their feet on fire failed not only because of this, but also because cases of fraud were so difficult to prove. Spanish lawmakers were determined to punish Rodrigo Rado, the ex-president of Bankia, for the bank's failure in 2012, but only managed to jail him for misusing the company's credit card. We demand that bankers take risks. Silencing them so they can only make the safest loans lowers their profits, raises borrowing costs for entrepreneurs and prospective homeowners, and lowers interest rates for savers. In Daniel Sun's words, people will not save and companies will not borrow. Factories are not built, the economy does not grow. There is clearly an acceptable level of risk, a level of risk that enables innovation and progress but does not cause the system to crash. The problem is, we don't know what it is. In the most compelling, and brutal, episode of the illusion of control, Daniel's son explains why our attempts to measure and predict risk seem more like risk theater than reliable analysis. To properly assess risk, 
we need to understand that different investors care about different things depending on their exposure levels and time horizon. Still, it's much faster and more profitable to aggregate all kinds of risks into a single total number. The author makes fun of the ECB's supposed ability to measure the systemic stress of the financial system to six decimal places on any given day. Such accuracy looks impressive, but shows little correlation with what actually happened. According to the ECB's dashboard, systemic stress was near an all-time low just before the 2008-2009 crisis and peaked after the crisis began. Of course, Daniel's son convincingly argues that it should be the other way around. Another difficulty in predicting and preventing systemic financial crises is that they do not occur often enough. Daniel's son calculated that an Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development member country suffers from such an event every 43 years. Too long for the institutional memory of the crisis to last too long for it to last for just one generation. We also tend to adjust to prevent a recurrence of the previous crisis, rather than looking at future vulnerabilities objectively. Finally, regulators and bankers are in a constant, cat-and-mouse game, where the authorities impose new rules and those subject to those rules try to get around them. Quite regularly, the creativity of the mouse wins. Given how comprehensively Daniel Sun has outlined the challenges of applying Goldilocks regulation to the financial sector, that is, regulation with the right balance of risk acceptance and avoidance, it is somewhat surprising that he is so confident in our prospects of reducing the number of future risks. Collapses. Policy prescriptions depend on one word, diversity. He believes the biggest problem facing the industry is its drift towards monoculturalism, with a tendency to magnify the same shocks and inflate the same bubbles. Investors have always acted in packs, as de Neuville discovered. This trend has been spurred by the adoption of universal best practices, initiatives and the same risk metrics. Daniel Sun wants regulators to ensure that smaller banks, in particular, operate differently from large banks. It wants barriers to entry lowered and more players embrace circularity. But after more than 250 years of ups and downs, this will require a tremendous shift in how we think about risk behavior. Fresh food prices are rising at the fastest rate since the financial crisis. Households are bearing the brunt of rising inflation as food prices, especially fresh products like cheese, accelerated rapidly last month. Prices of fresh food products seem to have risen the fastest from 4.5% in May to 6.2% in June. The British Retail Consortium, BRC, noted that this was the highest inflation rate since May 2009. Overall, food inflation also rose from 4.3% in May to 5.6% in June. This is above the average recorded in both the 12-month and semi-annual period, and the highest inflation rate since June 2011. Turning to annual store price inflation, this figure rose to 3.1% in June from 2.8% in May, which was above both the 12-month and semi-annual figures. This marks the highest inflation rate since September 2008, according to the BRC. Helen Dickinson, CEO of BRC, said, Households and businesses have been hit by the highest inflation rate since the 1980s as record-breaking commodity prices in energy, transport and food were filtered through the supply chain. Food prices rose sharply, especially for fresh foods such as cheese, which were affected by the rapid increase in fertilizer and animal feed costs. As households face the biggest cuts in income since at least the 1970s and businesses grapple with upstream supply chain costs, retailers remain focused on protecting their customers. Fierce competition means retailers will continue to absorb these cost pressures as much as possible and seek efficiency in their business. Dickinson added that supermarkets are expanding their value ranges to offer customers a wider choice, with low traders and discounts to vulnerable groups. Retailers are trying to find more ways to protect their customers from the worst effects of inflation, but if costs continue to rise, the government may need to find ways to help retail businesses support their customers, he said. Everything is fine. Myron Jobson, senior personal finance analyst at Interactive Investor, said, while the tragic war in Ukraine is likely to further drive up food costs, energy prices, the outlook for consumers is bleak as energy bills rise again in the fall, exacerbating cost of living pressure on household budgets. With the cost of everything seemingly increasing, it can be difficult to gauge how and when your finances will be affected, so it's important to consider what protective steps you can take now to pay more attention to your financial well-being and avoid money. Then worry. Using supermarket loyalty cards and plans can go a long way in offsetting price increases. 
Most loyalty initiatives offer valuable savings by earning points, from exclusive discounts to members and free products. In the midst of the biggest drop in living standards in generations, every little thing helps. We are facing a global economic crisis. And nobody knows what to do about it. For years, central banks have come to the rescue of nervous investors. But now they are raising rates just as the world economy is reeling downward. In February, many investors were betting that the massing of Russian troops on the Ukrainian border was nothing more than an elaborate bluff. Russian and Ukrainian currencies appreciated as hedge funds and private equity firms showed their belief that peace deal would emerge, confidently buying the ruble in the Ukrainian hryvnia. Today, there is a war that effectively locks out the raw materials and food exported by both nations, and no one knows when the conflict will end. Investors are panicking in the face of uncertainty from the collapse in global stock markets and the decline in cryptocurrencies. Stocks in the US, where the S&P 500 index has fallen by almost a quarter since January, had their worst start in 60 years. We've seen panics before, especially after the 2008 crash. Despite their reputation as smart custodians of pension fund money, investment companies always hit the sell button at the first sign of trouble. Collectively, it leads to a rout. Seasoned policymakers know how to react in such uncertain times, and that is to do whatever it takes to reassure investors that their money is safe. Western governments plowed into their reserves, and when that cash well ran out, they borrowed heavily to maintain a stable outlook for their economies. The vital support came in the form of cheap borrowing from central banks. With low interest rates acting like the cavalry in a John Wayne movie, everyone was assured the panic would be short-lived. Not anymore. This time there is a real war, not just financial, and no one knows exactly what to do. The major powers disagree on how to tackle it, and policymakers disagree on how to deal with the fallout, particularly raw material and food shortages from Ukraine and Russia, which have pushed inflation to 10% and beyond. Especially central banks lost their courage. Rather than being a trustworthy asset, they add to the sense of panic by increasing the cost of borrowing. As one analyst said of the U.S. central bank's decision to raise interest rates by 0.75 percentage points last week, the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates until policymakers break inflation, but the risk is that they will also disrupt the economy. On Thursday, the Bank of England raised the base rate to 1.25 percent after a period in which it never rose above 0.75 percent for more than a decade. Some analysts believe the base rate will rise to 3% by the end of next year after Threadneedle Street puts the fight against inflation above sustainable growth. We know that the rise in the cost of borrowing in the UK, the Eurozone in the US that we are currently witnessing will do nothing to drive prices down. Inflation is a nuisance from Russia's invasion of Ukraine and, to a lesser extent, China's difficulties with COVID after vaccine development failures that have resulted in repeated isolations and detentions at ports. In the UK, Brexit adds another big twist as it hurts trade and reduces the number of workers available. The rationale for higher interest rates, then, must lie elsewhere, and central banks argue that to justify spasms of action, they must continue to avoid a wage spiral, one where wages exceed inflation. In Britain, this argument assumes that the average worker can negotiate a wage deal of 11%, which beats the Bank of England's latest peak inflation forecast this year, to avoid a fall in personal living standards. With the government expected to limit public sector wage increases to between 0% and 3% this year, this means that private sector increases should be even higher, around 12% or 13% on average. These salaries increase levels are fiction. Labor power is a mirage, except in some discrete pockets of the labor market. Yet it looks like the bank will continue to move forward anyway, making anyone looking for a reason to be confident turn to Rishi Sunak. The Chancellor has made it clear that she values financial honesty over open-ended commitments, whatever it takes to boost confidence. He speaks warmly to investors about low business taxes, special visas for foreign entrepreneurs, and a reheated Thatcherite plan to increase worker numbers by forcing more beneficiaries to seek employment. This is a weak business that will do little to improve the mood of companies looking to invest in the UK. Why is this global economic crisis different? For the first time since World War II, there may not be a cooperative way out. One of the remarkable things about the global economic order since World War II has been the resilience of governments to respond to severe crises. From the stagflation and collapse of the Bretton Woods currency regime of the 1970s to the Asian financial crisis of the 1990s and the global financial crisis of this century, 
the world's leading economies have proven surprisingly adept at finding ways to cooperate to overcome serious challenges. This time, this lucky streak might finally break. The current array of problems including the Russia-Ukraine war, inflation, global food and energy shortages, the resolution of asset bubbles in the United States, debt crises in developing countries, and the ongoing effects of COVID-19-related shutdowns and supply chain bottlenecks, could be the most serious crisis, especially since central banks cannot print wheat and gasoline. Still, there are few signs of the collective responses that will be needed to meet these challenges. Global cooperation has never been more urgent and seemed less likely. Worn collaboration is, ironically, often the result of past successes. The world's ability to manage past crises, circumvent disruptions and correct the global growth trajectory means that more countries today are rich enough to exercise their influence and demand that their interests be taken into account. Others pursue regional or ideological goals that they consider more urgent than immediate economic priorities. As a result, consensus has become nearly impossible to find. As a result, in this crisis, the world will be doomed to a series of competitive and partial responses rather than finding a way to regroup. An example is the trade minister's meeting at the World Trade Organization, WTO, in Geneva this week, originally scheduled for 2020 but postponed due to COVID-19. With 164 members and the rule that any deal requires consensus among all, the WTO is handcuffed. Member states are still struggling to approve waivers of patent rights for COVID-19 vaccines, for example, it's been more than a year since it could help. Similarly, they have been negotiating for more than two decades to stop subsidies that lead to devastating overfishing in the world's oceans. While the WTO once broke new ground for setting trade rules and resolving disputes, it has played little role in addressing current supply chain challenges. It is also unlikely to respond effectively to the global food crisis, as more than two dozen countries have already enacted export restrictions to protect their food supply, which is threatened by the collapse of Ukraine and Russia's grain exports. This week's meeting in Geneva could even entail tariff increases due to inaction. On Wednesday, a 1998 moratorium on cross-border e-commerce tariffs like Apple downloads and Netflix streaming automatically expires, with India and South Africa blocking its renewal. Of course, no institution is indispensable, and governments in the past have found new and creative ways to collaborate when old institutions proved incompetent enough. This was the case in the 1970s, when the world faced the closest analogy to today's challenges. A perfect storm of inflation, wars in Vietnam and the Middle East, an oil cartel that pushed up global energy prices, the collapse of the gold-backed monetary system under Bretton Woods, and the Watergate political scandal in the United States produced a period. Global instability and weak growth. At first, governments failed to cooperate adequately to meet these challenges. A burgeoning literature emerged at that time on the legitimation crisis of Western capitalism. But the finance ministers of the leading Western economies have met since then to try to establish a new monetary system after the United States. President Richard Nixon ended the dollar's convertibility to gold in 1971. These efforts led directly to the first G6 summit meeting in France in 1975. Here, the leaders of the major industrialized countries were tasked with finding mutually reinforcing ways to revive their ailing economies. The group that later became the G7, and later the G8 when it added Russia, but about to quit again after it annexed Crimea in 2014, continues to maintain a loose coordination structure for today's leading Western economies. After more than two relatively uneventful decades, the G20 emerged from a series of destabilizing financial crises, including the 1994-1995 Mexican peso crisis, the 1997-1998 Asian financial crisis, and the 1998 Russian currency crash. By then, significant new economic forces had emerged, and the creation of the G20 acknowledged the changing reality. The group includes China, India, Brazil, Russia, Mexico, and Indonesia, among others, and is expanding the rich countries club with a club that is more representative of the 1990s economy. Like the G7, the G20 began as a regular meeting of finance ministers and was escalated to an annual leaders summit during the 2008 global financial crisis. During the crisis and its aftermath, the G20 became the focal point of global efforts to restore economic growth, helped revive the global economy through coordinated stimulus measures, sought to strengthen financial regulation and expanded the lending capacity of the International Monetary Fund. Fund, capital, of course, such collaborative efforts have rarely been transformational. 
Both the G7 and the G20 lack decision-making powers and serve as efforts to encourage countries to adopt mutually supportive policies. The goal of such organizations is often to prevent problems from getting worse, rather than to develop grand plans for recovery. One of the most important achievements of the G20 during the global financial crisis was to obtain strong commitments from member states to avoid protectionist responses that would exacerbate the global slowdown. These commitments have mostly been fulfilled. Even such modest achievements are far better than countries that work for different purposes or actively undermine each other's economic interests. So, if the WTO is handcuffed by consensus and the G7 and G20 have no mandate, which group or organization can go to the rescue this time around? Simply asking the question shows how difficult it will be to have a global response to current crises. The United States and its allies are actively working to harm the Russian economy with the largest sanctions ever imposed, and Russia is responding by blocking Ukrainian grain shipments from black seaports. This leaves the G20 divided and powerless. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen has called for Russia to be removed from the group and threatened to boycott the meetings if Russia attends. While speaking, the Russian delegation, along with finance ministers and central bankers from several countries, left the G20 meeting in Washington in April. The meeting ended without the usual communique stating the areas agreed upon. However, it is unlikely to exclude Russia from the group. Only Canada and Australia have formally joined the U.S. request to do so. Indonesia, host of this year's summit, invited Russia to its scheduled November meeting, and issued a one-time invitation to non-member Ukraine. Russia's participation alone may be enough to neutralize the G20, but it is unlikely that other members will participate in any strategy based on strengthening the global economy while isolating Russia. China, in particular, refused to sever ties with Russia and focused more on self-sufficiency to protect its economy from the sanctions imposed on Russia by Western economies. These Western economies, through the G7 and other forums, are more united than they have in years, though there are persistent differences on how much to increase sanctions against Russia. This is no small feat. G7 economies still make up nearly half of the global economy and lead in cutting-edge technologies. The United States and Europe have largely overtaken the disputes over the steel, aluminum, and aircraft trade, which now seem trivial in the current environment. But the scale of the current challenges is beyond what the G7 countries can face on their own. For example, the G7 developed a potentially robust plan, backed by more than 50 countries, to address food security issues by expanding financial and technical support in exchange for countries agreeing to waive export bans and other measures that would further distort global food markets. However, India, which banned wheat exports last month, has so far blocked the initiative. New Delhi is also resisting other measures to free up food stocks for poorer nations to pursue greater self-sufficiency in agricultural production. The Biden administration has been creative in trying to find workarounds and build coalitions from like-minded countries. The US-EU Trade and Technology Council coordinates responses on issues related to export controls, data sharing, and flexibility in critical technologies. During his visit to Tokyo last month, US President Joe Biden launched a new Indo-Pacific economic framework that includes Japan, South Korea and India. While details are unclear, the new forum's aim is to foster collaboration on topics such as digital commerce, decarbonization, and tax coordination. At the Americas Summit held in Los Angeles last week, the United States announced the Americas Partnership for Economic Prosperity with a similar agenda. However, Latin America's second-largest economy after Brazil did not attend the meeting. Mexican President Andrés Manuel López Obrador boycotted the summit after the Biden administration ruled out Cuba, Venezuela and Nicaragua. While admirably creative, none of these initiatives remotely equates to the urgency of the moment. During previous crises, the world's leading governments have been able to put their differences aside long enough to find robust responses. This time it doesn't show up. This breakdown in cooperation may be the most enduring and worrying impact of the current array of overlapping crises. The cuts have so far not significantly damaged global trade as a whole. Trade values hit a record high in 2021, though slowing this year, and sectors such as food and energy were severely disrupted. But the current crises, whatever their differences, have harshly stalled confidence that the world's leading economies are united in the importance of economic growth and stability and can work together to the greatest possible extent to achieve these goals. This time there is no one running the ship. 
The CBI chief said he understands what it's like to live on the border, as he is one of eight children raised on Glasgow City estate by his father and mother, a teacher and nurse. People's costs and living standards will certainly go back in the next year or two, no doubt. People will have a more difficult standard of living for the next two years. We are going through a difficult time for individuals and businesses. McBride called for a more cohesive response from ministers to help businesses deal with the cost of living crisis, arguing that government should take responsibility for coordinating the response and we don't really understand that yet. Dot. Despite this, he said the relationship between the business group and the government has improved since fractious exchanges over the CBI's opposition to leaving the EU. McBride said the debate over Brexit is a thing of the past. The last thing this country needs are two or three years of debate and debate in a terrible civil war. I think the government has moved on and I think the business has progressed. McBride, who serves as a non-executive leader at the Department of Defense, said he could use his public service-wide connections to further strengthen the relationship between government and business. He talked about their goal of attracting new generation technology-oriented companies to the employer group. The CBI tried, but it probably didn't resonate that much with companies in the digital economy. I think my being there helped build a bridge. It forced Amazon to become a member and rejected criticism over whether the UK's leading business organization should lobby on behalf of overseas businesses. Some tax regulations have been called into question in the UK. If you have a presence in the UK or employ people here, I don't think there is any problem with them becoming members. If we were to represent only UK-based companies, we would cut off most of the economic activity. Top stockbroker, the US economy is heading towards supreme crash. According to stockbroker Peter Schiff, the US is heading towards a major economic collapse as inflation continues. Schiff, chief economist and global strategist at Euro-Pacific Capital, took to Twitter on Thursday to voice his forecasts for the US economy. Many people have finally given up on the idea of a soft landing and are now waiting for a hard landing, he said. But they still don't understand. The only possible landing is a collision in which everyone on board dies. That's why the hashtag Fed won't even try to land and give up the so-called hashtag inflation war. In his follow-up tweets, Schiff also countered those who claimed that he had not correctly predicted an economic crisis in America for the past 10 years. Those who claim I've been wrong about inflation for 10 years, that is, a stopped clock, still don't get it, he tweeted. I've been right for 10 years. I just warned early. Those who claim that inflation isn't a problem, or that it's too low at worst, have been wrong for 10 years. In another tweet, he added, the political reality is that the US economy will be in a serious recession in the midterm elections in November and will be in the same recession in the general elections in 2024. The main difference is that inflation and recession in 2024. It will be even worse. President Joe Biden rejected the idea that a recession is inevitable. In an interview with the Associated Press on Friday, he added that the high inflation was not his fault. Biden reportedly became somewhat defensive when asked about inflation, which was 8.6% annually in May and is now at a 40-year high after falling slightly in April. The president pointed out that other countries are experiencing inflation, although the U.S. annualized rate is one of the highest in the world, and touted low unemployment figures. The U.S. unemployment rate is currently 3.6%, in Japan 2.3%, in Germany just under 3% and in the U.K. just over 4%. They shouldn't believe a warning, said Biden, while thinking about the future of the U.S. economy. They just have to say, let's see, let's see which one is correct. And for me, you talked about a recession. First, it's not inevitable, Biden added. Secondly, we are in a stronger position than any country in the world to handle this inflation. That's bad. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? If it's my fault, why is it that inflation is so high in every other major industrial country in the world? Asked Biden. You ask yourself that? I'm not a smart guy. One must ask yourself this question. Why? Why? We've reduced the deficit if it's a result of our spending. We've increased employment, we've increased it. We've paid. Warning of debt crisis due to sharp rise in bills and inflation of food prices. One study found that the current cost of living is creating a growing debt crisis. Sharp increases in energy bills and the highest inflation in food prices in a decade are contributing to a significant drop in real incomes for all Scottish households, according to a new report. A study by the Scottish Parliament's Social Justice and Social Security Committee found that the situation has created a growing debt crisis for low-income people. 
The committee's report says both UK and Scottish governments should use what they have learned from the pandemic and the economic crisis to develop a way to distribute emergency funds fairly and in a timely manner. Debt and money counsellors are often a lifeline for low income and people with debt problems, but the report highlights the pressure counsellors face as many services are now at breaking point. Elena Witham, organising member of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee said, Our investigation has revealed the serious challenges facing low-income households across Scotland. We have heard surprising testimonies of how growing numbers of people who have even less money due to the rising cost of living are being pushed into debt. The reality is that people are in debt right now and things are going to get worse. Immediate action must be taken to help protect the lowest-income people who already must make impossible decisions about how even more limited budgets should be spent. We've also found that public institutions have a faster and tougher approach to debt collection, lagging behind consumer creditors, for example, with council tax. Denny and Charlene Kane of the Dunipace Citizens Advice Bureau summarized how challenging the situation could be. She said, It's really hard to help someone budget when they don't actually have the money to budget, and they don't have disposable income for us to deal with. As a result, we are holding hands with customers more than ever before. Customer cases stay open longer as we desperately try to find a solution. Considering feedback from our experts and the evidence shared throughout the investigation, the report outlines a range of actions needed to address the low income and debt problem. Advice to Scottish and UK governments includes increased support for those who need it most, more financial support for debt advisory services and the development of a debt management strategy that encompasses all Scottish government agencies to support their clients. There are signs that the mother of all economic crises is coming soon. Nigeria's May inflation rate stood at around 17.71%, an 11-month high, according to data from the National Bureau of Statistics. As alarming as this data is, most Nigerians may have an even worse experience when it comes to prices for goods and services. For many households, the prices of consumer goods such as food, drink and supplies have more than doubled since last year. Apart from households, Companies operating in the country also saw spikes in operating expenses and had to rely on price increases to offset the impact. Naira Metrics believes that the worst is yet to come and the signs are emerging day by day. Recently, diesel marketers warned that the price of diesel could rise to N1500 per litre, citing the rising global oil price, the impact of the Ukraine war in Russia, and general supply congestion around the world. Diesel prices rose immediately from around N650 per litre in May to N800 per litre. Diesel prices, which used to be N350 per litre, have more than doubled in recent weeks. Earlier this week, the Nigerian Independent Petroleum Marketers Association, IPMAN, announced that it is closing its filing stations because many of its members operate in hostile environments. Oil queues immediately appeared in Lagos, Nigeria's economic capital. Electricity prices are likely to rise as another tariff review nears in the next few months. Tariffs for Nigerians have more than doubled in the past two years, even if the power supply remains epileptic. In another ominous sign that things are going wrong, the exchange rate exceeded N600 over $1 in the days leading up to the multi-party primaries, in which Bola Tanubu, Atiku Abubakar and Peter Obi were chosen as the respective party flag bearers. This was the first time in Nigerian history that the exchange rate exceeded N600 over $1, increasing the difference from the official rate to N180, $1. The Nigerian stock exchange, often a pioneer for the economy, seems to have seen the handwriting on the wall. Stocks are currently down 5.3% month on month and are on track to close the month at a loss. Despite the negative real return on interest rates, over N2 trillion was pumped into treasury bills, suggesting investors were flying to the safety of government-backed securities. While these signs remain evident locally, events in the global economy also point to a possible global economic contraction. Some analysts predict a global recession that could trigger a major financial crisis, especially in Western economies. The impact of inflation, already rising in the West, has led to record increases in interest rates in the US, EU, and UK, forcing a market sell-off that has shaken cryptocurrencies and stocks. Recently, US President Joe Biden accused the world's largest shipping companies of raising freight charges for 40-feet container shipping, which has risen from around $1,300 before the pandemic to over $8,000 today. The impact is already being felt on global inflation and it is also seeping into the Nigerian economy. The increase in diesel and fuel prices is an example of this. 
all these signs point to a potpourri of catalysts for a major economic recession to befall Nigeria in the weeks and months ahead. If fuel and diesel prices rise as predicted and remain scarce, there could be massive food shortages and shortages of the basic items ordinary Nigerians need to survive. This will force companies to raise their prices as Nigerians' purchasing power declines, further stifling demand for goods and services. The exchange rate may drop to N700 over $1 much sooner than we expected, and it is still scarce. As companies struggle with declining demand, they may have to reduce losses by shrinking and triggering mass unemployment. The gradual impact this has on the security situation in the country could be dire. What should the government do to prevent this doomsday scenario? Facing a similar crisis brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic in 2020, the Nigerian central bank mobilized billions of naira in response funds and mainly supported the public and private sectors. The IMF also assisted Nigeria in the supply of basic dollars through structured loans, which helped stem the exchange rate decline. This option is unlikely to be available as the Apex Bank is currently fraught with many challenges to overcome. Politicians are also busy campaigning, so they pay little or no attention to the rapidly deteriorating economic situation. If Nigeria doesn't take urgent steps to fix things, it could head towards a severe economic crisis fraught with high costs of goods and services and a shrinking rate of economic growth. A reasonable option would be to borrow money to cover the income gap. A large eurobond offer can help ease the difficulties, although this will come at a cost, especially if we do not find the revenues to pay for it in the future. Nigeria could also seize the IMF and World Bank to boost forex, especially through new multilateral loans. This will come with significant costs and conditions, one would be to completely free the subsector, remove the subsidy, and let the Naira float. As we saw in Ghana, this option is great for markets but not a silver bullet. It comes with considerable pain, except that it leads to the cure of the disease. Nigeria needs urgent response to prevent a potential economic crisis. At this point, it doesn't matter whether this intervention is divine or not. The recession. How will it affect the London property market, and could we see a house price crash? The risk of the UK going into recession is rising. But real estate experts predict that the market will cool rather than collapse. And the unexpected drop in economic growth for the second month in a row has sparked fears that the UK is now facing a looming recession. GDP fell 0.1% and 0.3% in March and April, respectively, and city analysts warned that back-to-back -back monthly declines for the first time since the start of 2020 put the economy at risk of contracting sharply. Rising energy prices, rising inflation and the war in Ukraine are adding to the crisis. While a formal recession, defined as two consecutive quarters of decline, is yet to be avoided, the economic outlook has deteriorated in recent months. Bank of England economists announced today that they expect GDP to fall 0.3% in the second quarter of this year as the bank's Monetary Policy Committee voted to raise interest rates to a 13-year high for the fifth time since December 2021. With one year of leaked home prices, the UK housing market has so far seemed resilient to the storm clouds gathering across the economy. So, what happens to house prices next, and how might that change if the UK is hit by a recession? Is the UK going into recession? Months or even years of financial recession is a time when the economy begins to decline, with knock-on consequences for everything from employment to investment to housing. The UK went into recession in 2020 due to COVID quarantines. The economy fell 20% between April and June as businesses closed in 2020 and people were ordered to stay at home. It is not yet clear whether the UK will enter another recession, but the country's leading business group, the Confederation of British Industry (CBI), said it believes economic growth will be 3.7% this year, down from 51% last year. Toby Danker, the organization's chief executive, said this week, Let me be clear, we expect the economy to be pretty sluggish. It won't take long to get us into a recession, and it will feel like a recession to a lot of people if we don't. Could a recession cause home prices to drop? Typically, a recession is followed by a slowdown in housing prices. In the UK, the 2008 recession caused by the global financial crisis led to mass unemployment and a 20% drop in property prices, leaving many homeowners in negative equity. House prices today are extremely high, but artificially inflated due to the stamp duty holiday. As the cost of living spirals, inflation rises, and the gap between wages and home prices widens, some experts think a collapse is only a matter of time. But the likelihood of an accident is still low, 
according to Nick Whitten, JLL's head of UK Housing and Living Studies. Whitten said, There have been only four occasions since World War II where house prices in the UK have seen a sustained decline, and in each of these cases there has been a rise in unemployment, forcing many sellers to sell their homes. Takes longer. However, UK unemployment is currently at 3.8% and job vacancies have reached a record high of 1.3 million. We don't expect a collapse, but we do expect price growth to drop to around 4.5% by the end of the year. Impact on London property. But Tim Hassel, managing director of Central London rental agency Draker Lettings, said he thinks there is an increasingly high probability of an accident in the next two years, particularly in Central London. Noting that many property owners have substantial mortgages tied to low interest rates, he added, if interest rates rise above 1.5% in the next two years, the cost of borrowing will spiral out of control, which will make people sell and in the number of repurchases. We will almost certainly see an increase. At the same time, due to the increase in the cost of living, buyers will have less funds and therefore less willing or able to buy in a declining market. The UK market is strengthening with confidence and as soon as that confidence wanes, the housing market will be adversely affected. What will be the house prices after that? While experts think the housing bubble is unlikely to burst, many think the market has calmed down as growth slows after a year of runaway prices. In April, the Bank of England said mortgage approvals for home purchases fell to a two-year low. Halifax's latest home price index showed that while home price growth is still in double digits, it's now slowing and at its slowest pace since the start of the year. According to David Ruddick, head of housing operations for Representative Carter Jonas, a slowdown is inevitable, as the recent level of price increase is not sustainable. However, as demand still outpaces sales and rental supply, there is a big difference between the decrease in monthly growth and the decrease in prices, we do not anticipate this. Mark Schneiderman, director of London real estate agency Arlington Residential, added, there is no doubt that market sentiment is shifting to a much more cautious and largely negative view of what lies ahead. We will see that interest rates will continue to rise, making the property purchase process more difficult and fewer people will be able to borrow large sums, which will reduce market activity and consequently increase demand for both properties and values. Can be reduced. Everything, including the accident, is accelerating in the stock market. By the end of the 90s, it took three long years for an overvalued stock market to recover from its accumulated excess in what is now known as the dot-com crash. The fact that a similar showdown now needs only 14 months to happen is a sign of how fast this market is moving and how dangerous it is getting to anyone who believes they can choose a moment to buy and sell. The dangers came into full view on Friday as a warm inflation reading rattled financial markets and swayed the S&P 500 from the range it set this month. Investors have been stunned by the latest wave of selling, seeing the index rise 9% since nearly entering a bear market on May 20. Persistent inflation is only the latest threat to a market that has been battered by a series of macro blows. Trying to figure out which is more important has become the job of idiots. That's essentially the opinion of Eric Schoenstein, co-director of the $9.7 billion Jensen Quality Growth Fund, ticker JENSX, which surpassed 96% of peers last year, according to Bloomberg data. With inflation, the Federal Reserve, a pandemic, and the war wreaking havoc with investors, the only safe bet at this point is that stock volatility will continue. It feels like there's nothing you can point to and say, why if we clear this and that piece, everything will pass and we can move on to the next iteration, Schoenstein said over the phone. With all this uncertainty, the market will pull back and frankly, Investors are probably in a mode where they sell a little bit more haphazardly. The S&P 500 was down more than 2.5% as of 11.05 p.m. in New York on Friday as unexpectedly high consumer prices fueled forecasts the central bank will need to toughen its battle against inflation. The index, which fell almost 5% in five days, is having its worst week since January. The propensity to sell everything you can has contributed to an epic drop in valuations. After peaking more than 30 times its earnings a year ago, S&P 500 multiple stocks shrank roughly 40% during its May low, nearly the size of the contraction during the entire 2000-2002 crash. In other words, the correction in valuations is happening three times faster than the bursting of the internet bubble. According to Gina Martin Adams of Bloomberg Intelligence, the accelerating decline reflects how much the post-pandemic stock rally has relied on the Fed. When the central bank faltered, easing was barren. 
When the easy money disappears, the bubble disappears, said Martin Adams. The foundation of the 1990s bubble was market psychology related to growth prospects and share ownership. It was harder to put out. Thanks to solid gains, the meltdown in P.E. has done less damage to the market at the price level. Still, down 19% from its January peak to the bottom of May, the S&P 500 has endured at least its third shrinkage of this magnitude in four years. According to the Leuthold Group, such oft-repeated turbulence has never been experienced since at least 1950. An unusually volatile economic and political landscape underlies the repetitiveness of the stock turmoil. After falling into a recession during the pandemic, the U.S. is booming after unprecedented government and central bank stimulus. The Fed, which has spent most of the past decade battling deflation, is battling the fastest inflation in the last four decades. To the bull's delight, the first two losses, one in late 2018 and the other in early 2020, were almost wiped out in a matter of months. While the stock has yet to recover from its 2022 slump, anyone who bought the stock four years ago and stayed invested would have had a 12% annual return since then. It's fascinating that the S&P 500 has yielded somewhat solid results during four years of incredible volatility and uncertainty, said Jim Paulson, Luthald's chief investment strategist, in a recent note. Oftentimes, the stock market returns, while most of it waits for the dust to settle. Volatility and uncertainty can be signs of trouble ahead, but they also often point to great opportunity. But now the big difference is the stance of the Fed. Unlike in 2018 and 2020, when the central bank came to the rescue quickly, such a safety net no longer exists for policymakers who are laser-focused on taming inflation. Conflicting narratives abound. As the recession debate continues, economic data and corporate earnings continue to point to a healthy business cycle. Jensen Schoenstein says he avoids predicting where stocks will go. Rather than timing the market, he says, investors should focus on choosing stocks that can withstand prolonged economic downturn. His firm is insurance broker Marsh & McLennan Company and Moody's Corp., a credit rating company, took advantage of this year's sale to increase the holdings of stable growers such as, when you do this individually, company to company, in a high faith, is the market at the bottom, is the market at the top, or where is the market going? Turn around, said Schoenstein. This will give you the ability to sleep more at night. Financial crisis rules put house prices on the brink of a collapse. If a home price crash is coming, it doesn't seem to bother Barclays much, which has agreed to pay a staggering £2.3 billion to buy specialist mortgage lender Kensington Mortgage Company. The acquisition significantly expands the bank's exposure to mortgage provision and can therefore be read more broadly as a vote of confidence in the resilience of the UK property market. However, it seems strange to buy at this stage, when the economy is at the peak of recession, interest rates are rising sharply to counter rising inflation, and household disposable income is under acute pressure, and this moderates it. A rising interest rate environment theoretically makes mortgage loans more profitable but does not lead to increased defaults. After a brief hiatus during the initial lockdown, when the housing market was essentially closed, both the supply of mortgages and the demand for them exploded, with banks scrambling for market share, which has traditionally proven to be a relatively low-risk form of lending. House price adjustments come and go, but very few of them end in excessive guilt. When faced with tough times, mortgage repayments tend to be the last thing households get interrupted. You may lose the holiday and the evenings at the bar, but you will not lose the house. Banks tend to view mortgage lending as a safe bet for this reason. If you want to see how safe it is, consider this. In the early stages of the financial crisis, the government nationalized Northern Rock without compensation. At the time, it was feared that the mortgage lender would lose his shirt in the overheated housing market. I didn't. In the second round, the government made a profit of £12 billion from loans. Default rates were not only low but lower than any other UK lender. The problem was liquidity, not solvency. But there is another reason banks wear themselves out in lending, thereby helping to fuel what is quite obviously another bubble in home prices. And about our old friend, the exaggeration. It branched out on its own in the wake of the financial crisis when Britain decided to impose its own form of Glass-Steagall, the Great Depression-era US law that separated investment banking from retail and commercial banking. Other jurisdictions in Europe considered this, but eventually backed out, choosing instead to rely on globally accepted higher minimum capital and liquidity requirements and better settlement regimes. The UK was particularly contrarian in deciding to pass legislation on public fencing, 
which drew a strict demarcation line between retail and wholesale banking and theoretically one could not overturn the other. This particularly harsh approach was not entirely surprising. Britain had suffered a more serious and costly banking crisis than almost anywhere else. Therefore, the political class was under greater pressure to minimize risk to taxpayers by addressing concerns that some banks were too big to fail. The purpose of the protection was to isolate retail banking services such as deposits and overdrafts from the banking elements considered most critical at the time, non-retail activities such as investment banking and international banking. Given the scale of the damage wrought by the global financial crisis, this seemed like a reasonable enough approach, but as some of us warned at the time, it turned out to be both unnecessary and costly. Worse still, there is growing evidence that the UK economy is fueling its dependence on ever-rising house prices. Paradoxically, fencing may have made the UK banking system less secure rather than more secure. By design, ring fencing has resulted in a concentration of retail deposit funds within ring fence. This has been particularly so since the beginning of the pandemic. Thanks to the central bank's printing of money and enforced lockdown savings, the enclosed banks found themselves full of deposits. According to a recent assessment by the government's Independent Protection and Proprietary Trading Panel, excess liquidity above the internal liquidity targets of the five largest gated banks was £120 billion as of September 2021, tripling the pre-COVID level of £40 billion. As a result, the enclosed banks resulted in massive amounts of underutilized capital and liquidity that desperately sought a profitable distribution. What could be better for the money than the mortgage market? No wonder house prices are skyrocketing and are now threatening to straighten out sharply, deepening the impending recession. Ring fencing appears to have resulted in another extraordinary predictable misappropriation of capital. The government's independent panel diplomatically concluded in a recent report that the benefits likely outweigh the limitations. But still, I wonder if he would say that if the obvious surplus had made its way in the housing market, it would have resulted in a downright collapse. All regulatory pressures are prone to unintended, unintended consequences. Ring fencing seems to be another classic case at this point. We survived the 2008 financial crash and WWII, but I've never seen a time like this. Construction companies are in danger of sinking despite the post-quarantine building explosion. Chris Carr's family-run business is facing the worst it's ever seen. Founded over 100 years ago by its grandparents, Grimsby-based Carr & Carr has survived many economic cycles and major global events, including the 2008 financial crash and World War II. But rising material costs and current conditions, coupled with staff shortages, are unlike anything experienced before. I've never seen a time like this, it's the perfect storm, says Carr, who has been a developer for almost four decades. The worst thing right now is material shortages and we're seeing double-digit increases in prices as well. It's hard to set a price for a job and tell someone when it will be completed because you don't know how much the materials will cost and you don't know when you're going to get them. But Carr may be one of the luckier ones. Industry-wide problems have forced hundreds of small family businesses into bankruptcy. This means that despite increased demand from families seeking renovations in the wake of COVID, many have struggled to find a builder or have had to delay plans that have taken too long. Carr says he had to wait up to six months for roof tiles that used to come in two weeks, while bricks took two months instead of two weeks. A lot of people think it's too much risk now and they don't want to do it anymore, says the managing director. Instead of having an extension now, people will probably wait until next year. Neil Morley, construction industry expert and director of reconfiguration consultants Interpath, adds, I know from personal experience that it has been really challenging for a builder to get the cost of building and outbuilding in the last 6 to 12 months. If you didn't get started right away, you wouldn't be able to get someone to come to you to make an offer, let alone put something on hold. These small local builders were under business, but were unable to fix prices on material, so they felt things sharper. Company failures are on the rise. According to the Bankruptcy Service, the number of bankruptcies in the construction sector increased by 142% in February from 127 in the same month of the previous year to 307. A further 400 smaller construction businesses in the UK went bankrupt in April, marking a nearly 50% increase compared to January 2020, according to the latest figures from the Office for National Statistics, ONS. The number of construction bankruptcies is higher than any other industry in the UK. Interpaths Morley says creditor voluntary agreements, CVAs, a form of bankruptcy, 
are up nearly 57% compared to pre-pandemic levels. He adds, bankruptcies are on the rise but right now we are seeing mainly the bottom side being affected. Usually creditor voluntary liquidations, i.e., small businesses with less than 50 employees, are collected. They are quite specialized. They're usually people who are less complex in their contracts, so they aren't affected by price increases. It follows consecutive lockdowns that triggered an explosion in the home improvement industry. In 2021, the Industries Building Products Association, CPA, reported 20% growth in the repair, maintenance and remediation market as households use the savings from curfews to fit their home offices as work patterns change and begin loft expansions. Yet raw material prices were starting to rise even then, and leading consultants at Interpath first noticed signs of distress in the construction industry. Morley says, at that point, we thought there was too much pressure on the supply chain. There were many people on fixed price contracts, labor was becoming more expensive, and raw materials were becoming more expensive. It was just putting too much pressure on the industry. Now, the CPA has warned that the market will fall 3% this year and 4% in 2023. Construction materials inflation rose to 22.5% in May due to disruption in the supply chain and rising energy prices. According to government figures, among the basic materials used daily by home builders, prices of timber and steel products rose 30 and 45 points respectively in April, while leading brickmaker Forterra increased its brick prices by 12% from the 1st of April. Alongside inflation, China's strict lockdown measures and the war in Ukraine are increasing existing supply chain disruptions caused by the coronavirus backlog and suspending home improvement projects. Beijing's zero-COVID policies have caused shipping costs to rise due to port delays, while the Russian invasion of Ukraine has reduced the supply of important regional nickel, copper, and iron exports. David O'Leary, policy director for the Home Contractors Federation, HBF, said, The situation in Ukraine, coupled with the high demand for building materials through the pandemic and since then, has made things particularly grim. Broader energy costs are also a big factor in the production of building materials. So, a triple blow for the industry. For the new building industry, this has increased the cost of building materials, but there are also additional taxes, fees and regulations coming into the industry. Meanwhile, labor shortages are also hampering the construction industry, with the Structural Timber Association recently warning that staffing shortages could pose a bigger problem than a shortage of building materials. Interpaths Morley argues that the situation for home builders isn't going to improve anytime soon, he predicts a more significant nuisance in the final months of 2022. Managements will start to rise because there will be pressure as we start to see a slackening in demand for commercial buildings as people see the UK economy start to slow down a bit. And that will pick up later this year. O'Leary of HBF says, the entire industry is better equipped today than it was before the financial crisis. But it is extremely difficult for small players. They face many challenges. For them, Inflation of prices is less, but about availability. There are also labor cost increases.